achievement by offering a recruitment to all of those people who have been slogging their guts out since the mid-90s to today. And, um, and I have to say, one step forward, two steps back. And just briefly explain why it is I'm so gobsmacked. Uh, once upon a time, I used to direct legislative programs for health ministers in this state. And in that role, I was responsible for the repeal of the venereology legislation that obliged people to report themselves when they had a venereal disease and report themselves for treatment. And before you were married, you had to go and have a test to see if you were infected with any sexually transmissible diseases. During that time was when AIDS became prevalent. And as part of legislation, again, that was introduced during my time, it was made an offence to request that a sex worker be tested. It was against the law in not just living memory, but in the decade. That's why I'm so astonished. I don't, I don't understand. Because my great mother is a history, I'm going to now research this uh, until I understand every last aspect of how it is that we could have gone from black to white to black. So, having said that, I do want to also acknowledge that I'm not the only one who thinks this, and that many of you out there have also been fighting a good fight. But um, when you saw, as I did, when you saw such positive change to be so quickly reversed, you will understand why I feel not just um, uh, concerned by this, but really emotionally distressed by it. So with that, I will now introduce our next speakers. Uh, Jules Kim is the manager of the Commonwealth Government funded migration project at Scarlet Alliance, the Australian Sex Workers Association. Since 2009, Jules has been the coordinator of Scarlet Alliance, surveying sex workers in Australia in partnership with the Australian Institute of Criminology. And this is conducted in Chinese, English, Korean and Thai. And Eleanor Jeffrey is a sex worker and president of Scarlet Alliance. Eleanor is a member of the Single Opportunity General Roundtable, People on Trafficking, and has published extensively on sex work and safe migration issues, including trafficking. And currently, Eleanor is involved in the Scarlet Alliance Migration Project. testing are a real game changer for the conditions, the headspace, the philosophy and the legislative system that sex workers are working within. Scarlet Alliance is the peak body of sex worker organisations in Australia. It formed as a peak body in 1989. Um, it's a recognised peak body on HIV and trafficking issues in Australia. Our organisation is led um, by, by sex workers, all of our volunteers and staff and management of sex workers and all of our voting members are sex workers. Um, I would like to acknowledge that there, as well as myself, there are many, if not most of the people in this room are also sex workers. I'd like to acknowledge that being in a position such as the President of Scarlet Alliance and being out in this forum it gives me a role and um, a status of privilege to be able to speak out as a sex worker when many of you in the room perhaps don't have the um, ability within your lives or the desire within your lives to speak out and identify as a sex worker. As such, Scarlet Alliance does not um, uh, 
draw on or you know, talk about our own individual personal experiences. Rather, we're drawing on a body of knowledge of very strong evidence of trends and of issues in the sex industry that we know to be true in a reliable sense for most people in the sex industry. Um, sex work research projects in Australia that we're drawing on for this, um, for, that we're drawing on in, the, in this presentation, uh, including the ones on the board here, are important because they were led by or done in partnership with sex workers in Australia. These research projects that are led by and done in partnership with and um, in a way uh, authenticated by being a voice of sex workers shape government policy through submissions, laws, advocacy, ministerial advisory committees, and this is the um, research that is used to explain the epidemiology in Australia. Sex workers have led these discussions for 30 years in this country. It is in sex workers' benefit, and it is in our community's benefit, for sex worker policy to be, to be based on reliable evidence from good ethical research. Sex workers have led and participated in these research projects for 30 years, and we're going to draw on those today. Okay, I'm conscious of the time restrictions, so we're just going to steam through the next one. It's just as a background to the research that we are presenting today. And this is the Chinese speaking sex workers in Australia, done in 2006 and 2007, which was C10, uh, which is a sex work organisation <coughs> in Hong Kong, and, and it's done by it. This um, was presented first in 2008 in the Mexico AIDS Conference, of uh, which you all have a copy, hopefully by now. Um, and the outcomes demonstrate little significant social differences between Chinese women and other sex workers. Moreover, Chinese sex workers successfully adapted to sex industry conditions in Australia. None of them were coerced into coming to Australia or coerced to work, but rather freely chose to travel overseas to engage in sex work. They failed to conform to the popular but mythological image of sex slaves who were victims of a brutal system of trafficking. What was important in this research is to understand that sex workers of Chinese language background were just as likely to use condoms and just as likely to access health and welfare services as any other sex workers in Australia. Also, Chinese sex speaking sex workers in Australia actually displayed a higher level of trust in the criminal justice system and we, um, we uh, speculate that this is a result of coming from a, um, a, a different criminal justice system in China where the level of trust is very low and conversely the, the level of trust in the system in Australia is a lot higher than say sex workers who were born in Australia. Okay, so the main survey that we are presenting on today was uh, expanded from the initial Chinese survey, which we briefly touched on. The methodology was established through discussion agreement between Scarlet Alliance and the AIC, the Australian Institute of Technology. And um, early contractual negotiations included agreement that the 2010 survey instrument would be an updated and expanded version of the 10 survey. Uh, you've got a pamphlet handout um, of the um, survey. That's the little DL, is the explanation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a number of surveys collected across Australia. So this is in, uh, no, sorry, um, this is not the number of surveys, this is the number of collectors, sorry, trained in each state, which will give you an idea of the differences in numbers. So the differences in numbers are in no way representative of the sex industry or the type and nature of the industry, but are merely um, because of the, the number of collectors in each state and territory. Additional four in Sydney was because early on we identified that we had a high number of Thai peer educators, which meant that we were getting a lot more Thai responses, and which has nothing to do with the actual nature of the industry. So we did an active recruitment of Chinese and Korean peer collectors, and which resulted in a much stronger showing towards the end. Okay, so this um, what highlighted for us was the, the lack of investment in on in sex work organisation generally, but in particular for migrant sex workers uh, to work within sex work organisations. So uh, we, an unintended consequence is that we trained <coughs> sex workers who were interested in participating as peer educators to be involved in this project. 
So peer education training included um, covering things such as referrals, issues that might come up um, during the research, as well as the methodology and administration training to ensure consistent delivery of the survey instrument. So the, the benefits of using multilingual peer educators were readily apparent. So the, in, in terms of, I'm just going to outline a few of those. In terms of trust and cultural understanding in both the sex worker and migration context was huge. So that there were uh, those issues and those um, were already able to be understood and addressed prior to surveying and commencing. And this also addressed the power balance that happens in any research project when you as a researcher go into a sex worker's premises. There is a disclosure issue that so that, that part, they haven't chosen to disclose to you who have come to their work. So that there is going to be initially that power dynamic established from the start. We also, um, by having a multilingual uh, collectors as well as a multilingual survey, meant that we had proper informed consent <coughs> and the ability to answer questions in language. <coughs> we also got the benefit of the existing network of collectors, so we recruited a lot of sex workers working in non-legal contexts that had their own networks that we could draw upon for the collection. So we feel that a, a very strong benefit of this and an unintended consequence was an investment in self-representation of the economy in the migrant sex worker community. So this is a picture of a typical staff team in any given sex worker organisation in Australia. This happens to be the same staff team from Adelaide from 2005. And Scarlet Alliance leans very heavily on our membership in um, projects like this, rather than send um, newly trained collectors out into workplaces for the first time. What we um, preferred to do was to team up with or have the local sex worker organisation lead that collection. Um, all states and territories, uh, this particular staff team is very small. You've got a manager, a male project worker, a volunteer, a female project worker, and a multilingual project worker and sim runs are $230,000 per year, or then you've got this kind of spread size over $800,000 per year. So we've got all of these organisations that are, uh, are members of Scarlet Alliance, are peer based and have a firm of action employment and that's how we, um, and, and we as a national peer body draw on that. It's a very valuable collaboration because it means in something like research survey collection we're backing our work onto existing strong outreach. We're backing our work onto the trust that already exists. Um, we're building on the long-term relationships that already exist between the local sex worker organisation and sex worker communities. And particularly when it's language-based, that's very important. These partnerships have been going on for 30 years in Australia. Okay, the results show that peer collection approach is a great success. Now again, I, I need to emphasise this is no indication of the nature or size of the industry. We actually didn't target collections in Northern Territory or Tasmania, but they were online respondents, so that we do have a small number of them, but not really representative in any way. Also, the, the strong numbers in New South Wales are uh, because of and the Scarlet Alliance is a city-based organisation. It was a lot easier to recruit in our existing networks in Sydney. Also, so because we uh, collected in Workplaces, uh, brothel, private, street, um, we massage parlours, escort, um, we also collected within uh, Melbourne Sexual Health Clinic, during their language based clinics, and Sydney Sexual Health Clinic, and access many migrant sex workers there. Um, we, um, as Eleanor pointed out, also um, it drew on existing networks of the sex worker organisations in the state of territory. It was important to set criteria for the point at which a survey was too incomplete to be assessed with validity. Surveys were excluded in two phases, <coughs> outlined on the slide. So of the over 650 sex workers who participated in the survey, 594 were, had filled out the survey, enough of the survey in order to participate. Um, and it's, it's worth noting here that the major factor in the number of incomplete surveys is that survey collection is going on in a workplace where people, of course, are prioritising work over finishing our survey. We had an established protocol that we um, used. If a sex worker went off to do a booking, the survey was put aside using an established protocol so that they could come back and finish that if they wanted to and we were still there. If 
their booking extended or if we had to leave premises at that time, the survey went into the envelope, the envelope was sealed, it went into the box and all the surveys in the box went straight, went straight to the Institute of Criminology. We, had, we never opened the um, actual envelopes at any one time. And so as a result, there were some um, sex workers that hadn't filled out enough of it for it to be considered valid. Yes, and those sex workers were ineligible to re um, complete the survey as well as collectors were excluded from being uh, able to fill out the survey. All right, so um, just uh, as to reiterate, these are the preliminary first round analysis. The full results will be being launched in the next year um, and more of the nitty gritty of the survey will cover a variety of issues such as workplace issues, OHS, uh, job satisfaction, uh, migration issues. Um, a variety of different factors that, that can't be actually presented here. But uh, this is a, just a, a, an idea of the jurisdiction of the, the example. Mm -hmm. uh, the country, an issue came up when we were trying to address the issue of a migrant sex worker. So there are different, very variety of different ways that people identify as a migrant. So to compensate for that issue, we actually asked a variety of different questions, such as the country of birth, home country, and as you can see from the results, they are widely varied. So somebody might be born somewhere, but identify uh, their home country as some, something else. And also the language type of respondent chose to complete the survey. Um, in the analysis, we are using the ABS <coughs> standard definition of a migrant, someone who was born outside of Australia, but all those other factors and the data has been analysed against those other <coughs> migrant indicators. Here is a spread of the age of sex workers who were served and surveyed. We can tell you as far as the preliminary um, data goes is that this mirrors the um, work that was, uh, the data that was collected in 2006-2007 Chinese um, sex worker survey and the uh, multilingual surveys of severe sexual health in 1993 and 2003, all which indicate that migrant sex workers in Australia are of an older demographic than non-migrant sex workers in Australia. This makes sense in a, um, in a logical way. You know, of course, someone who is migrating is, um, has lived part of their life somewhere else and is going to be older in the, in the workforce in the land to which they have travelled to. And, but it also it goes against the mythology um, that migrant sex workers are somehow young and tricked into sex work. That is not the case. Migrant sex workers in Australia are more likely to be older than non-migrant workers. Um, in terms of um, HIV and condom use, we already know that STI prevalence is very low um, in sex workers in Australia, and that's because sex workers have taken, um, taken up peer education and we've taken responsibility for our own health practices. Um, condom use is consistently very high. That comes through all of the um, reliable data and epidemiology and surveys in Australia. And we found in the first round analysis of this data indicates, as with all other research of varying methodology, that sex workers' condom use is high, with over 90% of respondents stating that they always use condoms every time in a sex work setting. Uh, this is compared to, say, the um, Australian Research Centre in Health, Sex, uh, Sex Health and Society at Latrobe Beauty, really, which shows that um, only 20% of people in Australia generally use condoms in their most recent sexual encounter. That was a survey of 20,000 Australians. Okay, and just very quickly, this, uh, the level of education, and this is from the Bergen's research, that Roberta <coughs> Bergen's um, conducted in the 80s and 90s, and she compared that with uh, existing ABS data on um, non sex working females and that found that female sex workers are more likely to have a tertiary degree than females in Australia and compared against uh, males, that male clients of female sex workers are twice as likely to have a tertiary degree than men in Australia. And again, you know, the methodology was varied, but uh, early indications of our analysis shows that the previous findings of high levels of education amongst sex workers in Australia seems to be supported in this research. And this is, uh, there was no difference between migrant and non-migrant sex workers. Again, this is preliminary data on income expenditure in Australia of migrant sex workers. And it's worth noting that expenditure on drugs did not rate as significant in any way among migrant sex workers. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Okay. Access to justice, as um, Eleanor outlined, Chinese-speaking sex workers 
there's a higher opinion of police in Australian laws than non Chinese speaking sex workers. And from our recent research, the preliminary data supports continued willingness for migrant sex workers to access police and criminal issues. And interestingly, our sex work organisations was identified as their second point of contact for any uh, negative workplace issues that might come up. So, um, in conclusion, we'd just like to say that this data that's, that has been collected with non English speaking background migrant sex workers in Australia is an ongoing thread in the existing strong body of research in Australia that shows us again that sex workers do not fit this mainstream stereotype of what a sex worker is. Any mainstream stereotype of sex work is actually wrong when you compare it to the actual data in Australia. And when it comes to trafficking stereotypes, it is just as wrong as any other stereotype of what a sex worker is in Australia. This, um, you could reach the same conclusions if you did an analysis of actual trafficking cases in Australia, um, but as seeing as there's only been about four in the entire time of trafficking prosecution in Australia, it's, it, you couldn't say it's statistically representative, but this is a survey of over 600 um, sex workers in Australia, and we, we, we stand by this data, and so does the Institute of Criminology. And just in conclusion, we just wanted to remind everyone that um, even with the low budget of this research project, we also managed through the training of collectors to build a new pool of over 30 newly trained multilingual peer educators in Australia that are going to be an important workforce for health um, and promotion services. If those services have had funding to employ multilingual peer educators in Australia, those multilingual peer educators and the sex workers are more than ready to stand up to the task.
So we have these three clinics running weekly, um, and all sex work clinics are nurse led. Um, as I mentioned before, the Thai clinic has been running for about 13 years now, and that's a weekly clinic on a Tuesday with an interpreter and a nurse. Chinese and Korean clinics running for about six, seven years. The Chinese clinic is now run by one of our bilingual um, Chinese English speaking nurses, Hai Ping, and I run the Korean clinic with an interpreter um, every fortnight. Very, very briefly, in case anyone hasn't seen a sex work certificate before, this is what it looks like. Um, and as it currently stands with Victorian legislation, um, we see clients once a month for genital swabs. That's for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas in the genital exam. Anal swabs if required, and three monthly HIV, syphilis, and bloods. Also within our organisation, we offer six monthly spectrum exams, baseline hepatitis B, serology, vaccinations, and things if required, pap testing um, as and when required, and also offer um, throat swabs for gonorrhea if required. So we do accept there are barriers to communication um, uh, within the organisation, but this can be minimised when dealing with cold clients. And many factors need to be considered um, with, with regards to communication, such as religion, culture, beliefs, language, norms, values, emotions such as fear, anxiety, embarrassment, um, migration journey, life experiences, communication styles, non-verbal interactional styles, health beliefs, gender roles, disabilities, age, content of the information that we're giving to the clients, and their thought process, processing and understanding, perception of the, the information that we're actually giving them. Um, so quite a few challenges coming up with regards to establishing these clinics um, and there are challenges that uh, have um, occurred but they're not all exclusive to all called sex workers that we see. And I'll also just mention that rates of STIs in the sex work population as mentioned before are generally very low, below 3% and research has shown that sex workers have the um, lowest rates of STIs in the general community. So mixed misconceptions about infections and how they're spread Financial needs such as resettlement, um, sending money back overseas, ch um, student tuition fees, things like that as well. Possible limited employment opportunities due to lack of English. Possible cultural shame um, surrounding the work, emotional health and well-being issues. Students feeling that they have no other work choices due to lack of English. I've never possibly considered this avenue before. And a very big problem now that we've established the clinics and actually um, getting clients to attend the clinic. So in the last year it's been about 55% have not actually attended the clinic appointments at the Korean clinic. Challenges with um, communication and um, hesitation with answering phone responses to voicemails, <coughs> and what to answer the phone to withheld numbers and what blocked numbers, inability, inability to understand inability to understand written or verbal English and difficulty with our CASI system, which is a sort of self-registering computer system once you come into the centre. All clients have different levels of literacy and education. Um, the continuity of interpreters has been a problem. I think we've had four or five different Korean interpreters over the last few years, and also issues around compatible belief systems and values within um, working in a sort of sensitive, non-judgmental environment. Client concerns using the interpreter as well with regards to confidentiality issues. Um, potential clients to say what they think we want to hear, not disclosing partners outside of work who may need treatment and um, staying 100% condom use at all times at work and things. Um, danger of misinformation, wrong information from the internet, things like that. So really um, we need more development in language specific accurate health information. Some of the sexual health challenges, these are not published figures, but over the last year there has been a marked increase in gonorrhea and chlamydia within the Chinese and Korean sex work clinics. So 3 to 5%, that is quite high. And more research is needed looking into STI risk beyond work, um, whether this is um, infection through work, partners outside of work, returning home to work overseas, things like that. We're unsure of that. Transient lifestyles, working between states and countries with different varied laws and healthcare systems, more costly um, healthcare systems and treatment, and safe sex practice, uh, <coughs> possibly also less um, supported in Korea and China. There's a hepatitis B endemic in Southeast Asia, and we do see a lot of girls, a much higher prevalence of hep, chronic hep B in the Korean girls as well, which requires medical care, doctor review, vaccinations, further blood tests, and longer consultations. 
also higher incidence of urinary tract infections and cystitis, genital skincare issues, and reports recently of girls using like steroidal creams and tea tree antiseptic dental douching and things like that. So currently trying to develop a package um, in their own language just to give a bit more advice and support around these issues as well. Also, um, diminished capacity to negotiate safe sex practices and assertiveness in negotiation skills. Some of the factors affecting condom use, uh, possibly self-perception of low vulnerability to infection, misconception of how the infection is transmitted, lack of negotiation skills, client refusal, lack of support from brothel or peers, offered more money, long-term um, client who they trust or unpleasant taste and smells of condom. Some of the reasons we can give so where are we now with some of the developments? We now have language specific um, Thai, Korean and Chinese sex work information packs in every room and also downloadable from our internet um, site and website. Languages other than English um, uh, information is available for everyone to access. We now um, have the bilingual CASI system for everybody to sign in. That's in four languages, Thai, Korean, Chinese and English. Increased number of clinics and appointments available with the called clinics. Um, High Ping now runs a bilingual results and information line every Tuesday afternoon. We've developed a language specific triage tool. When people first come into the clinic to be assessed appropriately and um, develop discrete clinic cards um, in their own language and advertisement of called um, clinics and development of a language specific SMS appointment reminder um, and emails and things like that to send out as well. This is just what the CASI system looks like when they come and register. So there is the four languages there, so it's not too daunting. You can go and instantly um, recognise your own language. Uh, just an example of some of the appointment reminder emails. We used to send emails out in English. So hopefully this will help improve attendance rates at the clinics. These are the new clinic cards. Um, that have just been designed as well and can be kind of kept in hand by the person. They don't mention the word sex worker on them, it's Chinese, Thai or Korean kind of sexual health checkup, also with the language on the back. This is the um, article that was in the Red Magazine, I think last month or a few months ago as well, um, to try and sort of promote um, the awareness that the cold clinics and things exist. And this is a language specific triage tool as well, which is excellent to um, determine whether clients um, have any symptoms or what service they're looking for on that day. Internet resources as well, you can go onto our internet webpage and download the information on Chinese Time Korean. And there's a lot of other websites available around to show you that have got excellent non-English speaking resources. So the benefits to these clinics, to the client, convenience for the client. Um, if a client walks in without an appointment, um, a phone interpreter could be used, which is possibly not as effective. And they may, um, as Rosie mentioned earlier, have up to a three, four hour wait for, for a screen or be turned away to told to come back another day as well. Continuity for a client is that they can um, um, generally express preference to see the same nurse and the same um, interpreter every time, every time they come in for a visit. So confidential anonymous service and service provision is free, so they don't need a Medicare card. Um, clients um, receive non-judgmental, accurate, language-specific health information. We also have counsellors within the clinic as well and can refer to other support organisations like Red and things as well. Um, and it's been fantastic having a bilingual nurse as well and clients have really felt that they can relate to somebody with a similar cultural background and language. And now the Chinese um, clinic attendance rates have really, really improved as well, which has been fantastic. So where do we go now? Well, always continuously asking sex workers what they want from the clinic, from the service, what benefits them, any feedback, always appreciate feedback, how to make the service more friendly and welcoming for, um, for them. Continuous development of the called clinics to achieve positive physical, social, emotional health and wellbeing outcomes. Offering the, the monthly throat swabs as well, with those um, statistics that showed that there was a bit of an increase um, in the gonorrhea and chlamydia. Continuing at all times to promote 100% condom use at work. Three monthly sex work and network group meetings that have been run with contact tracers um, and with um, Gabby at Reading as well, which has been excellent. 
um, organising outreach brothel visits with RED as well, um, and continuing to support staff cultural awareness, and most importantly just to consider the role of trust, community engagement and interpersonal communication with effective services. <laughs>
Um, so we believe that yes, sex work is a skilled occupation and increased access to business will certainly go a long way in solving those problems. However, uh, I think that this it is a skilled work. Um, it needs to be included in that category, not as a visa for sex work. Uh, there are kind of policies of governments outside of Australia where it disclosing as a sex worker is quite dangerous. So there, um, look, in principle, I agree with what we're saying, but I, I think that a, a visa for sex work per se is maybe not the answer. But I'm very happy to discuss that with you. Uh, can I just say, uh, before I ask my question um, to the lovely ladies from the Scarlet Alliance, that both of your hats are fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for your um, talk. Um, I just wanted to um, clarify a few things. I'm a student of international development, and um, I just wanted to make sure that when we're talking about human trafficking, are we talking about um, the, the situation in which someone is coerced or forced um, into an end result of exploitation? Is that what you mean by human trafficking, or are you more meaning um, smuggling because people don't have visas? No, we are using the definition of trafficking as per the UN, as yep. per the Australian law, okay. which does not mean a person has been forced into sex work. Every case of trafficking in Australia has been a person who consented to sex work, who actively chose to come to Australia to sex work, but was tricked about the nature of the conditions of their work once they got here, such as work hours, such as location of work, such as the size of their debt. It's not sex work in and of itself that they were tricked about. Um, I should, we should remind everyone that at the UN level and at the Australian level, the consent of the sex worker is not taken into consideration in trafficking law in Australia, which means that if an individual consented to conditions of work that are considered in Australia to be exploitative, even if the individual understood and consented to every single part of that, the owner can still be prosecuted for exploitation. Thanks for that clarification. Based on, on that, um, that's what I was talking about a bit. Um, I just wanted to um, sort of um, go back to how you were referring to, I think both of you used the words um, myth or public perception or um, you know, generalisation stereotype. Um, are you saying that because you didn't um, uncover human trafficking in your survey that it doesn't exist, or are you just saying that it's not? I don't, I don't, we haven't even got those, uh, presented those results, so you're, you're drawing that yourself. So again, there's another perception that's just, you're saying that that's occurred. But um, it, we're not saying that at this stage, the results haven't been presented. The problem is the conflation of the idea of the migrant sex worker and trafficking. And this is what, um, and when, um, we're talking about the changes, that uh, a large part of the backward steps in sex work has been due to anti-trafficking policy. And that is a major, major problem for the human rights and conditions for sex workers. They are industrial rights issues. When you have a bad workplace, it's an industrial rights issue. But all of a sudden, because you're a migrant and you're a sex worker, you've been trafficked. You know, it's, so it, it's that uh, indistinction that's a problem. Yeah, the, law, the laws are the problem. Yeah, and the indistinction. So um, I just want to provide a delayed response um, to um, issues around mandatory testing um, in relation to um, uh, culturally diverse uh, sex workers or culturally diverse um, communities generally. Um, so I'm, I want to provide a different perspective. Um, it doesn't really demonstrate uh, my stance on mandatory testing, but uh, we know from research and from our services experiences that um, people from culturally diverse communities in particular women, uh, most likely uh, have poorer health seeking behaviours. They also um, have poor utilisation of services um, such as HIV and sexual health services. So with the mandatory uh, testing, it, it does provide an opportunity uh, for people to access the testing and treatment services um, in, in a way. Um, but I think with the situation with you know, culturally diverse communities is that because of the uh, different barriers that they experience in comparison or in contrast to other um, communities, I think this is where you know, it may be encouraging, but I'm not saying that um, it is a fair, but I do think it does help in a way. Thank you. 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 Thank
for them to access to government services. That doesn't explain then why in New South Wales and Victoria the rate of migrant sex workers as accessing sex worker health clinics is exactly the same, but New South Wales does not have mandatory testing, but Victoria does. So it is not about whether or not people should access health services, it's about whether they can do it at their own choice at the time that they can in the nature of the clinic that they want to, asking for the services they want to, instead of having to do it within a mandated place, a mandated system, a mandated approach. In 1993 and 2003, the Sydney Sexual Health Centre found that non-English speaking background sex workers were accessing the free STI clinics at a higher rate than English speaking sex workers. And the speculation around that was that those sex, migrant sex workers came from a country where you had to pay a lot of money for quality sexual health services, whereas in Sydney it was free, and so people were utilising it a lot. So I, what I would question back to you is, is the difference between health seeking behaviour between as between sex workers who are migrants and health seeking behaviour between sex workers, uh, between migrants who are not sex workers, because I believe like what you're saying doesn't match any of the data in Australia. And it's not an excuse. Um, down here. Um, I just think a little bit, it's sounding a little bit divisive when we're talking about, um, for example, health works and the nurses in there who are doing the mandatory testing, health testing. I think it's sounding like, as you were saying, you need, if, they, if people refuse to do these tests, that therefore the, the test wouldn't, it wouldn't be a law. I think you're putting the onus on the nurses and, and yes. health work. Well, I disagree with you. I think it's incredibly divisive. And I think these health works is a fantastic service. They're fulfilling, it's it's the need, like that's a law. A They're not making that law. A test is not a need. But that's not them making that law. They're, they're filling that. Anyway, I just find Too it easy. very, all right, I'm finding it very divisive and combative. So we need to have this argument. with translators or phone translators explaining the service, how we run um, and uh, what's about to be discussed, the sensitivity of the discussion and the questions and things involved um, and use a um, reputable registered linguistics language service and yeah. Can I speak to that as well? Yeah, um, we have had exactly those problems that you're talking about and the only way that we have found that it's effective in dealing with it and this is even with the same translation service, like using two different translators. And they can have these perceptions on board without even being aware that they're being discriminatory. So we are, a, a, recent, a, a recent episode was when we got this um, document back from a Korean translator service. So we have to use um, nationally accredited translators for our documents. Um, 
the, and the, the other translations we've got have been fine, but we always peer translation check because there are always going to be those issues, cultural sensitivities, appropriate language, and often when you translate it from English, it's very formal language that people don't use, so you're not reaching out to your target audience. And every time the word sex worker was there, because of her own prejudice, and it was a woman, because of her own prejudice, she put in sex slave, because that's how she knew sex work. You know, and if I wasn't Korean, I would have been handing these out, and everyone would have just been looking at me like, who the hell are you guys? You know, so the importance, I cannot stress the importance of peer translation checking, because a lot of times people can have these prejudices on board without even being aware of it. So just to outline our process, we start off with the Natty translator, then we come back and do a focus group of sex workers who are of that language background who are paid to do a translation check. Then they go into a telephone conference with the Natty translator. They nut out the to's and fro's of certain words. It goes back to the Natty translator, who then redoes the translation, and then it comes back to us as a stamped, accredited translation. The whole turnaround is at least three months, it is twice as expensive as what the first quote you get across the line is going to be. And if you don't do it, you'll have material that is substandard and, and that you probably shouldn't be handing out. Unfortunately, time's up. So, um, thank you very much. <laughs>